Hi, uh, I'm Dennis Brooks. Uh, I'm uh, head of the ophthalmology service at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, I have been a veterinary ophthalmologist since 1981. Uh, I've worked at the University of Florida since 1990. There's three veterinary ophthalmologists here at the university, and also we have three residents. Uh, residents are veterinarians who are in training to be ophthalmologists. Uh, we uh, have the probably one of the be biggest and best ophthalmology programs at a veterinary school in the United States. Uh, our reputation is that we are most interested in uh, glaucoma, in particular in small animals, uh, corneal disease in dogs and cats, but also we also uh, have a strong reputation for corneal transplantation uh, in the horse. Um, my, uh, what I hope to uh, get a across to you uh, this evening is that uh, the importance of basic anatomy, basic physiology of the eye, we're going to cover corneal disease in particular because corneal disease in small animals is the most important uh, uh, disease uh, for the general practitioner veterinarian. Uh, there are surely a multitude of other diseases we're going to mention, but what I want you to concentrate on is understanding uh, the tear film and the cornea because uh, the, 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 the diseases that you will see involving the cornea require critical decision making, uh, critical diagnostics, critical management in order to get the cornea to heal quickly. Uh, some diseases you also may run into are, uh, while in general practice are glaucoma, uh, some retinal diseases, but they're much less common than corneal problems. Uh, Lisa, could you show the book? Uh, there are several ophthalmology books related to uh, 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 small animals and large animals. Uh, this one uh, is, it came out in the year 2000. It's called Essentials of Veterinary Ophthalmology by Kurt Gillat. Uh, it has, uh, it's a relatively small book, relatively inexpensive for medical textbooks. It has a multitude of, of color pictures. It's a wonderful, a wonderful book to start. Uh, uh, and use uh, to start learning ophthalmology as well as to use in the clinics. Uh, there are surely other atlases. There are veterinary ophthalmic surgery textbooks. Uh, this one kind of is the most comprehensive, and it's a good good book to uh, uh, utilize in the small animal practice. Uh, can we have the slides, Lisa? Uh, Ophthalmology is kind of an interesting subject for veterinarians, mostly because the animal-owning public is very interested in the eyes of uh, of their animals, whether they're pets or whether they're food animals or whether they're horses or whatever. Uh, this lady uh, had this Siamese cat that couldn't see very well, so what she did was, uh, after talking to ophthalmologists and so forth, she went and had glasses made for this cat. And uh, as you can see in the picture, the cat actually wears them and actually sees better. The cat's a very nice Siamese cat. Uh, you can see she had little, uh, the glasses were actually worn upside down. Uh, you can see the little strap on the back of the, of the head uh, that holds the glasses on. The cat wears them all the time. I was pretty shocked by this. I thought that the cat's, uh, cat would knock them off, but it has a little chin strap underneath, has a little back uh, uh, strap around the, behind the ears, and the cat wears these a lot. Um, people are very interested in the vision of their animals, and so many times animals will be presented to the veterinarian for eye problems when the owners uh, are, are less concerned about uh, skin problems or less concerned about intestinal problems, whatever, but they're very concerned about whether the animals can see or not. Uh, it's very important to understand that the eye is a small organ and it has limited ways to react to injury. Uh, the eye has more transparent structures in it than any other organ in the body. And so uh, when these transparent structures get sick, they become cloudy. Uh, the eye has more avascular structures in it than any other organ in the body. And when the eye gets sick, these avascular structures grow blood vessels into them. And so these become noticeable to you. They become noticeable to the client. And it's important to develop a, a reasonable approach to how you're going to work up eye problems when they're presented to you. And the thing that I'm going to emphasize this evening is that, is that you always think about the cornea and that you rule out corneal problems before you decide that it's uh, not a corneal problem or before you decide it's uh, an eye, uh, an eye uh, problem that involves different or other parts of the eye. 
So we're always going to be thinking of cornea. Uh, it, whether it's a blindness problem, whether it's a painful eye, we're always going to be thinking about the cornea. Is the cornea the source of the pain? Because the cornea, which is the clear outer windshield of the eye, the cornea is one of the most sensitive tissues in the body. So if the animal is painful, and they usually manifest pain by squinting, and I'll show you pictures of animals that are squinting, uh, they may be manifest pain by uh, having increased, in, increased tearing from their eyes, and I'll show you pictures of animals that have too much, uh, too much tear production in response to pain. Uh, the cornea it can be the source of pain. The, uh, the cornea can be the source of increased tearing. So you're going to, I want you to concentrate tonight on thinking about cornea and eye problems. A cornea can cause pain. A corneal problem can cause blindness. I mean, and there are surely other eye problems that can too, but the eye is small and it has limited ways to react to illness. So it's very critical uh, that you begin to think of, of eye problems uh, occurring on the surface of the eye, eye problems in the middle of the eye or inside of the eye, and eye problems in the back of the eye. Now we're going to start uh, tonight by going through some general anatomy, a little bit of eye physiology, and we're going to cover diseases along the whole way at the same time. Uh, we're going to talk about diagnostic tests in particular, and a little bit of therapy, and then there'll be uh, time for questions and answers, uh, or questions, and hopefully I'll have answers uh, for the questions that you have. Uh, I am going to emphasize corneal ulcers uh, once again because that is the a, uh, the absolute critical area for the general practitioner. It's an area that m mistakes are made. Uh, if mistakes are made, that uh, this can result in severe consequences to the eye. If you misdiagnose a corneal ulcer, which is a corneal scratch on the surface of the eye, uh, that can have terrible consequences. Whereas if you misdiagnose glaucoma and misdiagnose maybe a retinal problem, maybe there isn't a whole lot can be done uh, for those kind of issues anyway. But corneal ulcers are treatable, and they're most treatable early in the disease process rather than late. And there are medical treatments and surgical treatments. We'll emphasize medical treatments tonight. But it's, it's critical that you, you diagnose a corneal ulcer uh, if it's present, or rule out the presence of a corneal ulcer so that you can go on to thinking about other 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 eye diseases that may be uh, causing the animal to have pain or loss of vision. Uh, this is just a general diagram, I'll, and it's, it's not too easily seen by you, but uh, later on we'll show smaller versions of this so we can concentrate uh, on specific parts of the eye. We're going to start at the front of the eye, which is on the left side of the screen, and then we're going to work our way to the back of the eye, which is at the, at the right side of the screen. Uh, animals have two eyelids, uh, 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 traditional eyelids, I suppose. Uh, they're, uh, dogs, anyway, have eyelashes on the upper lid, which is in the upper left part of the screen. Uh, the upper eyelid is much more important than the lower eyelid. Uh, the reason is that the upper eyelid is the one that moves. The lower eyelid doesn't move much. Uh, the upper eyelid distributes the tear film. And tear, uh, the, the tear film, which sits on the surface of the cornea, is absolutely critical for the health of the cornea and the health of the eye. And distributing that tear film is also very important. The eyelid, uh, both of them have glands in them that produce part of the tear film. Uh, remember also, uh, animals have a third eyelid, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, that, that humans do not have and primates do not have. But dogs, cats, horses, and cows have a third eyelid, and many other animals do too, especially the birds. Uh, on the left of the screen, is, 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 you can see there's a, a, a whitish line that's the cornea. Just behind that is a, is a spherical structure called the lens. Uh, behind the lens is a very large cavity called the vitreous. And when you get to the right side of the eye uh, is the retina, which is the nervous part of the, uh, of the eye. Uh, the eye. The retina is the most metabolically active tissue in the body. Uh, it's more, more metabolically active than the brain has a tremendously high need for blood. So the eye uh, has a, a tremendous blood supply, even though that, that blood supply is concentrated to a few specific areas. Remember, the cornea has no blood vessels in it. The lens has no blood vessels in it. The vitreous has no blood vessels in it. And in some animals, the retina does not have any blood vessels either. The, the blood supply to, a, to an animal that has an avascular retina uh, is provided by, provided by another part of the eye called the choroid, and we'll talk about the choroid after a, a little bit too, uh, because the choroidal blood supply, blood supply is tremendously large. Now, this is a cat 
It has uh, kind of unique eyes. It has a on the right side of the screen, that's the cat's left eye. It, it has a blue iris. Uh, on the the cat's right eye, which is on the left side of the screen, has a yellow brown iris. Uh, the cat has once again uh, two eyelids. The cats do not have eyelashes. Uh, at the nasal part or the inner uh, uh, part, medial part of the eyes, the cat has cat. Uh, this cat has uh, a third eyelid as well. If you look at the uh, 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 both eyes together, you'll see that the, the you don't really see the cornea. Uh, there's some little white reflections from the camera flash that are reflecting back from the cornea, but the corneas are transparent. The corneas, this cat has normal uh, corneas, so they're very shiny, uh, no blood vessels in them. Uh, the most prominent thing is is, you, is the, the, the pretty irises, the blue one in the left eye and the uh, yellow one in the right. And if you look at the reflection from the pupil, the pupil being the hole in the center of the iris, uh, in the left eye with the blue iris, the, the uh, reflection is reddish. And if you look at the reflection from the right eye pupil, uh, that reflection is green. And what we're seeing is a reflection from the retina, uh, the back of the eye. And in the, uh, the reason the iris is blue in the left eye is because there's not very much pigment in the iris. Uh, and because there's not very much pigment in this white cat, uh, there's not very much pigment in the iris, uh, many times if there's no pigment in the front of the eye, there's not much pigment in the back of the eye. And so that's why we're seeing a reddish reflection, because those are blood vessels from the choroid. The choroid supplying a lot of the retinal metabolism. Uh, in the right eye, on the left side of the screen, the cat has a, a yellow, yellowish iris, yellow-brown. And the reason it's yellow-brown and not blue is because it has more pigment there. Uh, in the iris, and if the cat has pigment in the front of its eye, it probably has pigment in the back, and that's giving a, uh, this greenish kind of reflection in the uh, right eye is due to increased pigmentation. Now, here's a little diagram, that, uh, uh, another type of diagram. I'll try to show you several diagrams so you kind of get a little bit more, better feel for the anatomy and a little bit better feel for the, the physiology of all this. And we'll look at the diagram uh, on the right side of the screen. You can barely see a number one at the extreme uh, right side of the of the screen, and the number one is actually sitting in what's called the anterior chamber. At the top of that diagram is a is a white structure that's the cornea. And as you move from the white into uh, the brown, uh, the white is the cornea, and the brownish part where the number four is, uh, is that, that area is as an area of transition between the white cornea and what the I'm sorry, between number four is called the limbus, and it's the transition between the clear cornea and the white sclera. The sclera in this picture has been colored brownish. And the, the, the sclera and cornea form the outer fibrous coat of the eye. Uh, the number one is sitting in the anterior chamber. You see a number three there as well, which is uh, called the angle, and we'll get to what the, the importance of that in just a second. Uh, as you move, uh, uh, Look to the picture on the left side of the screen. Uh, the, the cornea is at the top. Then we have the anterior chamber. Then we have the iris, and the iris is colored a little bit of blue. And then there's a hole in the center of the iris called the pupil. Behind the iris, or is a, a yellow or yellow on my screen? Maybe it's green on yours. But it, uh, there's a circular structure, and that's the lens. And the lens is used for focusing or for for seeing up close. Uh, you don't need a lens to see far away. You just need a lens to see up close. You and I use our lens for reading. Uh, animals don't read, but they surely have the ability to see up close, and the lens helps uh, in, in close-up vision. Uh, moving a little bit uh, downward or, or posterior is a large cavity co uh, colored rather orange in your uh, in your view, and they, the, this is called the vitreous. And the vitreous is 99% is water, and it just kind of provides support to the lens, provides support to the retina. As you move below or further uh, towards the bottom of the screen in the, in the uh, picture on the left, you'll see uh, just a whitish area, and that's where the retina would be. Uh, so we have at the top of the screen on the left, we have the cornea, then we have the anterior chamber, then we have the iris, uh, then we have the, the lens, then we have the large vitreal chamber, and then we have the retina, and then coming out of the back of the retina would be the optic nerve, which takes the uh, visual information to the to the brain. The eye doesn't see anything. The eye is just a photoreceptor. It's a very important photoreceptor, 
But the brain is what sees. The eye doesn't see any vision at all. It just collects visual information, sends that energy to the brain, and the brain interprets all the electrical stimuli and creates an image in the brain. So the eye is just a photoreceptor. It, it, it really doesn't have much to do with vision at all except for collecting the light. If you look at the back of the eye with a phalloscope, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, this is, uh, but this is the retina. And uh, the, 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 the whitish structure uh, in the center is called the optic nerve. And you'll see there are retinal blood vessels that are red uh, coming, out from the, uh, 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 coming out from the optic nerve. At the top of the screen is a bluish structure. That's called the tapetum. And the tapetum is actually in the choroid. Uh, the tapetum is behind the retina. So if we look at this picture, uh, we're actually uh, sitting in the vitreous looking at this picture. And uh, the, you can't really see the retina because the retina, when it's healthy, is transparent. Uh, those vessels, those red blood vessels, they're in the retina, though. Uh, the optic nerve is a blind spot, and it, what it does is it, it's just the axons of one, one layer of cells of the retina. And uh, the optic nerve takes the retinal information and takes it back to the, to the brain, and that's where the brain interprets this information and creates a visual pattern. The tapetum at the top, this bluish area, in this animal it's blue, uh, is a, an adaptation for night vision. The animals that you and I work on have very good night vision, probably better night vision than they do day vision. And we'll talk about what the tapetum, how, how it actually works a little bit later, but the, 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 the tapetum is very pretty. And there's a lot of individual variation from eye to eye, from animal to animal, from breed of animal, from species to species as to what the tapetum looks like. Uh, but the tapetum is actually not in the retina, it's behind it. So you and I are looking at this picture, we're sitting in the vitreous, and we see the retinal blood vessels in the retina, but we don't see the retina itself. And then, uh, But we're looking through the, the ten layers of the retina, and then we see the tapetum, which is at the blue, blue area at the top of the screen. And the tapetum is in the choroid, and then what would be behind the choroid is the sclera, and we can't see the sclera in this picture, but we'll see it in the next one. This is, that was a dog. Now, this is a cat. This is a cat that has a blue iris. And uh, if an animal has a blue iris, the reason it's blue is because it does not have much pigment in it, in the iris. If they don't have much pigment in the front of the eye, many of these animals don't have much pigment in the back of the eye either. And so in this particular cat, uh, we can see the optic nerve on the right side of the screen, right at the very edge. And you can see some red blood vessels in the retina moving towards the optic nerve. But all the other, the, all the, the orangish color uh, to the rest of the screen, the orange lines that you see, are choroidal blood vessels. Normally we don't see the choroid because there's tapetum and pigment in the way. Well, this animal doesn't have any pigment, so we can see choroid. And the whitish areas between the choroidal blood vessels between, uh, is actually the sclera. So in this animal, we can see the retina, because we can see the retinal blood vessels. We can also see the choroidal blood vessels, and we can the area between the choroidal blood vessels, which is white, uh, is the sclera. So this is a normal cat, uh, but it's a little bit different than an animal that uh, would have a pigment in its iris, where we'd see tapetum and or pigment in the retina as well. Uh, so if, when I uh, when I show the, the, this picture to my students in, in in class here at the university, I always ask them what color the iris is, and uh, because the color, like I said before, the coloration in the front of the eye often influences the amount of pigmentation in the back as well. So this is a cat, a blue a blue eyed cat. Now this is a dog that's not normal. Normally you can't see the retina. Now the optic nerve in this dog is at the bottom of the screen. And you'll see that uh, there's some rather billowing folds that, uh, just at the 3 o'clock position at the optic nerve and at the 9 o'clock, big folds uh, that, that are coming off uh, uh, adjacent to, to the optic nerve. And this is an area where there's fluid underneath the retina. It's pushing the retina forward. This dog has a systemic problem that's uh, uh, causing too much protein in the blood, and these too much protein is getting in the in the retina, and blood is actually, uh, uh, or plasma is actually accumulating here and causing what's called a retinal detachment. The only part of this retina that's actually normal in this picture is is the area that's brown immediately below the optic nerve. That area is attached. 
But as you move away, you can see these big folds or billowing veils uh, of tissue. And this is the retina, and it's, it's abnormal. It's come loose from its normal location. And when it come, came loose from its normal location, it's now becoming opaque. It's a little bit gray, a little bit cloudy. Normally, the retina is transparent. But this retina is detached. It's lost its blood supply, hopefully temporarily. And uh, this is kind of an important picture, because even though this is a dog, because uh, what we've seen in cats now, as we see cats in Florida, cats in the United States live longer, uh, some of these cats get kidney disease. And I'll show you a picture later that as some of these cats get kidney disease, uh, they get high blood pressure. And high blood pressure can cause uh, the cat to detach its retinas. So it's important to look, it's important to understand this, because this is a treatable disease. Most kinds of retinal detachment in animals are not treatable. Uh, and yet the uh, cats with high blood pressure due to bad kidneys, uh, that's a treatable disease. And so it's pretty important to know that because the cats can be blind. We lower their blood pressure with medicine, and as the blood pressure goes down, then the cats can regain their vision. It's very exciting, very nice. Uh, owners are happy, and cats are happy too, and the veterinarian's happy because we can, we can effectively treat some types of retinal disease uh, just with pills and maybe dietary uh, management. Now, the eye uh, is protected. It sits in the skull. It's protected by the bone of the skull. And this is a picture of a dog's skull. And you can see lots of uh, little uh, circles, uh, uh, little foramina that where the blood vessels come to the eye or the optic nerve leaves the eye. Uh, this is uh, actually the uh, uh, left uh, side of the skull. So that uh, and the, in the dog anyway, in the cat, uh, the eye sits in the circle uh, where you can maybe see the letters E, O, P, and uh, I think O, R. The eye sitting in there, the jaw would be at the bottom of the screen. And uh, the eye is protected on all sides except the lower part uh, of the, uh, the ventral part of the orbit uh, where the, there's muscle and soft tissue. And if you keep going past that in, in the ventral part of the orbit and keep going ventrally or keep going lower, uh, you eventually end up, end up in the mouth. Uh, so if we get a space-occupying lesion in the orbit, the orbit is the part of the skull that contains the eyeball, if we get a space-occupying lesion in the orbit, whether a tumor or an abscess, it can affect the position of the eyeball itself. Uh, also, the skull that surrounds the uh, orbit, uh, that surrounds the eyeball, is uh, uh, surrounded by sinuses. So sinus disease can invade the orbit, which is the bony part of the skull the eyeball sits. Sinus disease can involve the orbit and, and cause uh, and influence the position of the eye. Uh, a tumor inside the orbit or the sinus can, can influence the position of the eye. Or, an, or uh, a tumor inside the mouth can uh, grow into the orbit and influence the position of the eye. And I'll show you what that means in just a second. Because the eye is protected, the eyeball is protected by the skull. Uh, the bony part of the skull that protects the eye is called the orbit. And yet, uh, it's only protected on all sides except the lower part. On the, on the on the medial side, on the lateral side, it's uh, protected by bone. The eyeball is protected by bone. But on the lower part, if you go from the mouth behind the last molar, molar tooth, if you go up in, uh, behind the last molar tooth in the mouth, you'll get behind the eye. Uh, your optic nerve is there and a whole lot of blood vessels. Well, if you get a, a, a space-occupying lesion, say a tumor or an abscess, behind the uh, Eye, it can affect. It can look like this, and you, the, the, this dog, the dog's left eye on the right side of the screen, uh, is being pushed outward. The third eyelid is being pushed upward uh, because there's a tumor behind the eye that that is growing, and because it, it, the tumor really can't grow through bone uh, unless it's a horribly malignant tumor, uh, it pushes the eye out, pushes the eye forward. Oops. Uh, and when it does that, then sometimes the eyelids cannot protect the cornea. It it, the animal can't blink very well, and that's what's happening in this, this picture where the, the, eye, the eyeball is being pushed so far forward that uh, the, the tears are drying out and causing an ulcer. Uh, this is a very sad case. This is a two-year-old dog. It had a very highly malignant tumor. And if you look behind the last molar tooth on the right side, 
You see the tongue is there, and, uh, and, and right above the tongue on the right, behind the last molar tooth, is a pinkish area. You can see on the, look on the right side of the screen, there's, it's a brown pigmented area behind the last molar tooth. But on the right side where the, the lesion is, this tumor is growing down into the mouth. And uh, so we biopsied the tumor there and found out it was a fibrosarcoma and uh, eventually had to remove the eye to save the dog's life. Uh, in order to, because uh, the eye was painful, the eye was, was going to be blind, and we, we just couldn't, had no other way to get at this lesion. Uh, but this is where we made the diagnosis. Uh, an abscess could present the same way. I would love to, I wish this would have been an abscess. We could have drained it here uh, and used systemic medications to try and get rid of the infection. But this happened to be a tumor. It's usually an old dog disease, an old cat disease, but it still uh, can happen in young ones too. So if the eye is protruding forward, uh, we have to consider whether it's a tumor or an abscess. This is a cat, a very old cat. The cat's actually looking straight at you. And uh, But you see that from the reflection of the camera, the left eye on the right side of the screen, the left eye, uh, you can't see the reflection from the back of the eye because the camera's uh, flash is bleached out completely. But if you look at the right eye on the left side, we see a more of a, more of a reddish kind of reflection because that eye has been deviated or pushed to one side. You also see between the eyes is an ulcerated lesion. This cat had lymphosarcoma in its sinuses. It was eroding the bone. It eroded through the skull between the eyes. It also pushed the eye forward. It also grew into the mouth, just like this dog. And this is a very bad case, as you can imagine, because it was a, a lymphoma is a systemic, a systemic disease that caused it, that resulted in this animal's eye problems. So uh, uh, I just want you to remember that the that the, the, the the, the skull protects the eye. Tumors and abscesses can, can affect the eyeball itself. But also, so can trauma. This little cat got bit by a dog. Its left eye is okay, but the right eye has been pushed forward, or called proptosed, from the orbit. This can be surgically repaired. This eye is intact. Uh, there's no blood inside the eye. You can see the iris and the pupils dilated. There is uh, probably some, some skull damage, a little bit anyway, in this particular little kitten, uh, because it takes a tremendous amount of force to proptose the eye, especially in a cat compared to a dog. Very easy to proptose the eye in a Los Opso or a Shih Tzu or a Pekingese. Uh, a little bit harder to proptose the eye of a Doberman or a, a Rottweiler or a large dog. Very difficult to proptose the eye in cats due to trauma. I mean, this happens in humans too. Uh, where there's a blow to the skull or, or compressive force to the skull that results in the eye being uh, pushed outward. The therapy is anesthetizing the animal and gently pushing the eye back in and doing and suturing the eyelid shut temporarily. We can go over therapy for this in the question and answer period if you wish. This is a little diagram again to talk about eyelids. Remember that cats have and dogs and horses uh, have three eyelids. The uh, upper one is uh, uh, the upper eyelid is. In some animals, has eyelashes. Uh, cats don't have eyelashes, but dogs have eyelashes on the upper lid. And uh, there are also uh, glands in the lids that produce part of the tears. Um, number two, the, the, the junction uh, between the sclera, uh, the white part of the eye, and the, and the clear cornea is called the limbus. Uh, covering the sclera is a mucous membrane. And this mucous membrane is called conjunctiva. Very common eye disease, maybe the most common eye disease in animals is conjunctivitis or inflammation of this membrane, and we'll talk about some specific kinds of causes for conjunctivitis in cats in particular after a little bit. Uh, where the two eyelids meet is called the, uh, the, uh, the canthus. Um, that's that's the, on the, the far left. Uh, there's a, a lateral canthus and a medial canthus. And, and then you have to consider that at the medial canthus, which is on the right side of the screen, are uh, are two little ducts or two little openings that drain the tears. There's a, it's called, there's a superior little puncta and an inferior puncta at the medial canthus. And uh, it, those are very important to know that because if an animal has eyelid disease that involves the medial canthus, uh, treatment of the medial canthus can result in obstruction of those tear ducts. Whereas uh, those, those tear ducts are not on the left side of the screen at the lateral canthus. So lateral canthus disease is much easier to treat because uh, you're, there's no tear ducts there. Uh, the third eyelid is also at the medial area, and we'll, we'll show that after a little bit. 
The iris in this picture is brown, and the, 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 the uh, pupil is the hole in the iris. The pupil regulates the amount of light, intense light, that comes in and, and hits the retina. Uh, this is a cat, and if you look at the upper eyelid, uh, a little bit of pressure was placed there, and you can see little um, uh, lipid-type material coming out of, of the glands of the eyelid. These, this is called the meibomian glands. Uh, their upper and lower eyelid, you can many times just look, looking at the eyelid, you can see a, a series of little tiny little holes. And uh, this, this, in this particular picture, uh, we just put a little pressure on the eyelid and squeezed out some of the, of the fat-like tears that produce part of the tear film. This uh, meibomian glands are uh, uh, very important for uh, preventing evaporation of the watery part of the tear film, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But uh, I just want you to realize that the, the, the lids are very metabolically active. They, the upper lid is the one that moves, distributes the tear film. The eyelids are very vascular. They heal very nicely. Um, they also produce part of the tear film. Uh, upper eyelid disease is more serious than lower eyelid disease. Uh, lateral canthal disease uh, is less serious than medial canthal disease because the medial canthus is where the tear ducts open and where the tears drain. And at the medial campus is also where the third eyelid is. And the third eyelid acts like a windshield wiper. And we'll, we'll show that here in just a second as well. Now, the eyelids have, are very vascular. They have a tremendous blood supply. This happens to be a horse, but the uh, same thing happens in dogs and cats. Uh, I just repaired a dog, uh, dog bite uh, eyelid laceration a, a week or so ago. And uh, when, uh, this horse has had a laceration of its upper eyelid. And it's the same in horses. Upper eyelid disease is much more serious. Uh, than lower eyelid disease, and so these should be repaired uh, surgically and not just uh, snipped off and this little uh, flap of tissue just removed. Animals need their upper eyelids, uh, and so uh, this type of thing is very surgically beneficial. Even if it's even if it's been off a few days, even if the laceration's been there a few days, uh, the, the, the the tissue does not get necrotic because it has such an extensive blood supply. And uh, so these should be surgically repaired, and most of the textbooks have some very basic information as to uh, repairing eyelid lacerations, eyelid injuries, uh, and they're very beneficial for the patient. Now, this is a cat, again, who in the right eye, which is on the left side of the screen, it, its third eyelid is protruding. It's also squinting a little bit. If you look at the, at, at, at the position of the two lids, uh, the, the, there's a little bit of droopiness to the eyelid in the right eye on the left side of the screen. The left eye on the right side of the screen, the left eye is normal. Uh, also, uh, the, the eyelids are droopy in the right eye. The third eyelid is protruding in the right eye. And then if you can, try and look at the pupils. The pupil in the left eye is normal. But maybe you can barely see that the pupil in the right eye is a little bit smaller than the left. And the, generally, the pupils should be fairly similar. So see if you can notice that. Let's try and look at the pupil. So maybe it's a little bit dark, but try and see that the pupil in the right eye is much smaller than the pupil in the left. Now, uh, what I want you to remember from this picture is that third eyelids, when they protrude, that may be an indication of eye pain. So if I saw this cat, the first thing I wanted to do was find out if this cat was painful in its eye because of a corneal ulcer. So the first thing I did was I looked over this cat very extensively for a corneal ulcer. And I'll show you how we did that after a bit. What we did was stain the eye with a dye called fluorescein. Now, what I expect from you is that when you are presented with a dog or cat or horse or cow eye problem, for the rest of your career, every eye case that you see, you will stain that eye with fluorescein dye to make sure and identify the presence of a corneal ulcer or the absence of a corneal ulcer. In fact, if we were all in the same room, I'd make you raise your hands and promise to me that the rest of your career, that everyone, 100% of all the eye cases that you see in your career, you'll stain every one of those eyes with fluorescein dye looking for corneal ulcers. Corneal ulcers are painful, and uh, identifying a corneal ulcer early will minimize the, the scarring that can occur with the corneal ulcer. Remember, the cornea is transparent. When the cornea heals, it gets cloudy. Animals are better off with a small scar in their cornea than a large scar. So I want you to promise me that you're going to be using fluorescein dye 
And I'll show you what that looks like. I'll show you what an ulcer looks like after a bit. At least if we go back to the picture, well, the first thing I thought of, when you see a third eyelid protruding like this cat's right eye on the left side of the screen, you want to find out if there's an ulcer there or not. There may not be. There may be something else causing the third eyelid, third eyelid to, produce, to protrude. But the critical thing for you as a medical professional is to find out whether there's an ulcer there or not. Now, in this particular cat, there was not. There's something else causing it. But that what I, uh, in this brief time tonight, we're going to just discuss and worry about corneal ulcers. This is the histology of a cornea. Uh, the cornea is about, uh, in a dog, is not, and a cat, is less than one millimeter thick. Less than one millimeter. Uh, the epithelium is, uh, is the reddish structure on the upper left part of the screen. That, uh, there's an epithelium, and when the epithelium is removed, when it's absent, uh, that's when the, you, the fluorescein dye adheres to the cornea, and that's when you have an ulcer. So the, the absence of the epithelium is an ulcer. Now, as we move into the cornea towards the left, or I'm sorry, towards the right side of the screen, we have the epithelium, which is red. The next part of the cornea is called stroma. It's mostly collagen. So most of the picture that you see in this, uh, in this uh, histology photograph, most of this picture... It's collagen. The epithelium's on the left. It's reddish stained here. And then as we move towards the very lower right corner, uh, there's one cell layer structure called the endothelium. So we have epithelium, we have stroma, then we have what's called a basement membrane called decimase membrane, which we'll get to in a minute. And then we have endothelium. So epithelium, stroma, which is mostly collagen, Desmase membrane, which is a basement membrane, and then we have the endothelium. Now, the cornea is transparent. It doesn't have any blood vessels in it. On the surface of the epithelium is a tear film. So here we go again. Tear film, epithelium, stroma, desmase membrane, and endothelium, and this is all less than one millimeter thick. It's very tough tissue, but the disease processes that attack the cornea in dogs and cats and horses, the disease processes are terribly powerful. And because this thing is so, the cornea is so thin, this eye can rupture in a matter of hours. If the, if the, if the diagnosis of an ulcer is missed and if the proper therapy is not instituted. Now, the, the tear film sits on the epithelium. The epithelium, right in the epithelium and just below it, are more sensory nerves than any other part of the body. But there's breed differences, too. The dogs and cats that have the short noses, the Pekingese, the, the Persian cats, the Los Opsos, uh, uh, Shih Tzus, those kind of dogs and those kind of cats, Persian, Timalayans, their corneas are not very sensitive. Well, guess what? Corneal sensation is important to corneal healing. Shih Tzus, Los Opsos, Pekingese, their corneas heal very slowly. And that gives the opportunity for some of the disease processes to cause more damage in a slow healing cornea than a fast healing cornea. And you have to anticipate that. The Los Opsos, the Shih Tzus, the Persian cats, and Himalayans, and so forth, their, their corneas are much more at risk of being permanently damaged and scarred than, a, than an animal, a dog or a cat that has a, a bigger nose and a more normal type of skull. So corneal sensation is important for corneal healing. Certain breeds of, talk, breeds of dogs and cats heal faster than other breeds of dogs and cats. <clears throat> now, Lisa, back to the picture. Most of the cornea is stroma, which is collagen, okay? Why is that important, and why do I want you to remember that? Because the bacteria that infect the cornea produce enzymes that digest the collagen. And we have to treat those, uh, treat against those enzymes. So not only uh, will we be treating the infection, we'll be treating the enzymes that are attacking the cornea. And so I'll go briefly go through that after after a little bit as to what kind of therapy would be, and then hopefully you ask me questions in the uh, uh, about therapy for ulcers because we could spend a little more time there. 
Uh, but we have to not only treat the infection, we have to also treat the enzymes, because these enzymes are in the tears, and they're very powerful, and they'll digest this cornea, which is very thin, in a matter of hours, and then we've lost. If the eye ruptures because the cornea, uh, these enzymes have digested the cornea, if the eye ruptures, we may not be able to save the eye. Maybe too late. Very painful. Also, uh, desmase membrane is at the bottom, and it is about two red blood cells in thickness, and there are some ulcers that go all the way from the epithelium to the stroma, and the only thing holding the eye together is desmase membrane. And I'll show you a picture. Desmase membrane does not stain the fluorescein dye, and there are no nerves there. No sensory nerves in desmase. And if we see a, an ulcer that, that involves all of the cornea, has eaten away all of the cornea, all the way down to desmase, that eye is about to rupture. That's a real emergency. Now, this is an ulcer. I don't have a, a, you can see in the center there's a whitish area of this cornea, and this is an area of, of the cornea that's being attacked by enzymes from a, a bacteria called Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is a very bad bacteria in the eye. It, it produces enzymes that digest the collagen. And uh, the, 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 the term is melting. What, the, what they say is these enzymes uh, attack the collagen and the cornea literally melts away. And the, because the cornea is less than one millimeter thick, it doesn't take very long for the digestion or the melting to, to rupture the whole eye. So this is what's called a melting ulcer. They're one of the most feared things in veterinary ophthalmology. A melting ulcer is one of the most feared things by clinicians. Uh, whether a general practitioner or a veterinary ophthalmologist. Melting ulcers are very, very dangerous. Uh, the therapies are very, very aggressive against them. Uh, here's a, a, a dog that has a, a superficial ulcer involving most of the cornea. The fluorescein dye is green, and I'll show you some other pictures of fluorescein after a bit, but this almost the whole cornea is, has stained green. So this is a very, very superficial ulcer, but it involves most of the cornea. Uh, I hope you can see this one. Uh, this is a very deep ulcer. And only the, and that's a, it's a little dark spot in the center of the cornea, and there's a little stain of green just on the right side of the, of the hole. Uh, this is an ulcer that's so deep that desmase membrane is exposed. Desmase membrane does not stain with dye, but some of the stroma around it is still uh, staining. So this is a very deep ulcer. This eye is about to rupture. Um, this is a, this is a, 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 a cat. Uh, whose conjunctiva is swollen. Uh, the conjunctiva is a mucous membrane that covers the sclera, covers the third eyelid, covers the inside of the eyelids. And uh, conjunctivitis, or pink eye, is also what this is called. And uh, it is very painful also. People that get conjunctivitis say that it burns and or itches. And so the animals also want to itch and rub at their eyes. Uh, it doesn't always have to be this dramatic as in this cat, but uh, this is conjunctivitis is a real problem in cats, usually caused by a virus, a herpes virus that's specific for cats, feline herpes virus. But other types of viruses could be a bacteria, could be environmental allergens as well. Uh, but even with this, we want to find out if there's a corneal ulcer or not, because the therapy for conjunctivitis uh, alone, or conjunctivitis with an ulcer, uh, is, is different. Now, the tear film, we want to mention that a little bit, too, because the tear film protects the cornea. And whereas the focus of my lecture is corneal disease, and we've mentioned a few others as well, we have to address the tear film, too, because if there's no tears, if there's no tears, then the cornea will uh, become unhealthy. And there's three layers of the tear film. Uh, you see at the, at the top, the uh, very top is a... Is a an oily or fat layer that comes from the eyelids. And I showed you earlier a cat eyelid that we were squeezing the meibomian glands. And, and this, this layer of, 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 of uh, secretion that's produced by the meibomian glands uh, is the outer layer of the tears. There's an inner watery layer of the tears, the middle layer that comes from the lacrimal gland and the third eyelid gland. And then there's an inner mucoid layer or inner layer uh, produced by the conjunctiva that attaches uh, the tear film to the corneal epithelium. And the, tear, the epithelium is normally very rough, as you can see in this picture, it's, it's the undulations at the bottom are very rough, but the, the um, tear film produces an optically smooth surface. It also, the tears allow nutrients to get at the corneal 
uh, uh, cornea because remember the cornea doesn't have any blood vessels in it. So one of the ways the cornea gets its nutrition is coming uh, is is provided by the tears. Uh, nutrients are in the tears are produced by various cells and they, they reach the cornea in the tear film. A lack of tears is called a dry eye. Now this little pug is a very sad case. Uh, and it's easy, most easily seen in his, in his left eye on the right side of the screen. Uh, he has no tears. He has a, a dry eye is what this is called. A keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis cica is the medical term. And this dry eye in this dog is beyond therapy. But there are some new therapies which, which we'll mention at the end of this lecture for dry eye. This used to be the worst disease that I saw because there was no treatment for it. Now I rarely see dry eye in dogs and cats. I rarely see it because practitioners as yourselves uh, can effectively treat it. Make the diagnosis and treat it because there's now a, a new drug called cyclosporin that's available. Uh, and it is very, very uh, 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 effective in, in a majority of these cases. So I rarely see dry eye anymore, uh, mostly because general practitioners effectively treat it. Uh, this just, I want to show you uh, 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 some iris problems, because it's also important in making diagnoses of specific eye diseases. Uh, this is a dog. You see he has a brown spot uh, on his iris, uh, just adjacent to the pupil, uh, at about the 2 o'clock position. And we always worry about spots like this, because um, they can be intraocular melanomas. Uh, melanomas are tumors. The most common primary tumor inside the eye is a melanoma. Uh, actually, lymphosarcoma metastasizing to the eye is, is the most common intraocular tumor in dogs and cats, uh, but that's a tumor that starts somewhere else. Lymphoma starts somewhere else and goes to the eye. But uh, melanomas are a are, are, are common problem, and, and you know, must be uh, observant of them. Something like this, uh, I just watch it and see, and see if it, see if it's going to change. If, if it's very, very aggressive, growing larger, uh, causing inflammation, uh, then we might be considering having to remove the eye surgically. Uh, this is a cat that uh, used to have two blue eyes. Uh, his left eye is still blue. His right eye is turned brown. Uh, this is an iris color change. Now, tumors can, uh, of the iris can cause the iris to change color, but so can inflammation of the iris. Uh, they call it an iritis or an anterior uveitis. Uh, the uvea, we haven't mentioned that word that yet, the uvea is the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. So the uveal tract of the eye is the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. And uh, inflammation of the uveal tract or uveitis in cats is very, very important disease. Uh, cats get uveitis quite frequently, caused by viruses, unfortunately bad viruses, feline leukemia virus, uh, feline immunodeficiency virus, FIV, uh, feline infectious peritonitis, FIP. Uh, these are all causes of uveitis in cats. Uh, so FELV, FIV, FIP are all causes of uveitis in cats. And so if the iris changes color, uh, it could be a tumor or it could be a, 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 a a, uh, an infectious process causing uveitis. So we do worry about iris color changes. Sometimes owners, owners will bring these cats to us and, and tell us that, that that's what they've noticed. Well, I, I know I, I, even I can't see this picture very well, but I just wanted to uh, kind of emphasize just because of glaucoma. Uh, on the lower, the bottom part of the diagram is the cornea. And then if we follow that up on the right side, that's the sclera. And where the iris meets uh, the cornea, where the iris meets the cornea is called the, the angle. And the angle is where the fluid that's in the front of the eye called aqueous humor, uh, the angle is where the fluid in the anterior chamber in the front of the eye between the iris and cornea, uh, the angle is where this fluid, fluid leaves the eye. Um, this is very important because in glaucoma, uh, this fluid aqueous humor cannot get out of the eye because the angle is blocked. So the, this aqueous humor, this fluid, is produced in the ciliary body, which is right behind the iris. It moves through the pupil into the anterior chamber, and then it leaves the eye at the drainage angle, which is between the iris and cornea. Well, in glaucoma, this, uh, the, the balance between, between the production of aqueous humor and the exit of aqueous humor, in glaucoma, this balance is disturbed so that the pressure inside the eye becomes elevated. And the reason the pressure becomes elevated is because the fluid cannot get out at the drainage angle. So many of the therapies for glaucoma are directed at the production of aqueous humor uh, and the exit of aqueous humor. And we'll mention this a little bit later on. But I just kind of wanted to briefly mention that uh, 
the importance of the of the drainage angle, which is between the the, the iris uh, and the cornea, that when that eye angle is obstructed, uh, the fluid cannot get out of the eye, and uh, the pressure inside the eye gets high, and when the pressure is too high, that's called glaucoma. Uh, this is just another uh, uh, picture of a cat. Uh, the, the, the top of the screen is the tapeta, which is in the choroid. Very difficult to take pictures of the cat retina because the tapeta reflection is so bright. Uh, the books say it's about 130 times brighter uh, than the human, than the reflection coming from the human eye. You can see some iris blood vessels. Uh, they're reddish. And then at the bottom of the screen, there's no tapetum, or, and there's no pigment. And so we're seeing the choroidal blood vessels at the, uh, nearly the whole bottom part of the picture. The optic nerve is in the center. Um, the tapeto color varies from animal to animal. This dog, I, I'm not so sure, he's a little, uh, little oh, six-week-old uh, golden retriever puppy, and the reflection from his eyes is blue. I hope you can see that. Uh, the tapeto changes its color about ten weeks of age in dogs and cats. So uh, puppies and kittens, the reflection from their eyes is blue up to about ten weeks of age when the reflection be becomes the adult color, which might be yellow or might be orange or might even be a little bit reddish-green. Uh, this is a diagram to illustrate the importance of the tapetum. What the tapetum is for is for seeing at night. And uh, what, if you look on the left left side of the screen, uh, the light c c coming through the cornea, through the lens, through the vitreous, and then hitting the retina, uh, passes through the retina and the left side of the screen and gets re and it stimulates the photoreceptors. Then it hits the uh, the tapetum and gets reflected back. And so it can stimulate, it has a chance, the light, the, 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 the photons of light have, a, have the chance of, of stimulating the photoreceptors twice. So light comes in through the cornea, goes through the anterior chamber, goes through the lens, then it goes through the vitreous, and then it goes through the retina where it stimulates the photoreceptors. In the tapeo part of the choroid, the light can be reflected backwards again to maybe stimulate the photoreceptors again. So it has two chances. On the right side of the screen, there's no tapetum. So the light, the, the, the photons of light coming into the eye as they pass through the retina, they only have one chance to stimulate the photoreceptors, then they're absorbed by pigment because there's no tapetum there to reflect the light back. So the tapetum is an adaptation for night vision. Here's a little tiger cub. You can see the, the tapetum is so bright that when I took the picture, I, all I got was a whitish reflection because, uh, normally because the tapetum is reflecting the light back. And uh, this is normal little tiger cup, but, you know, it's just, it's, tigers have tapetums too. Now, on this cat, where's the tapeto reflection? Uh, well, it isn't there. The reason is, is this cat has cataracts. Uh, what a cataract is, is the lens, which is normally clear or transparent, if the lens loses its transparency and becomes opaque or cloudy, uh, then we call that lens opacity, we call that a cataract. And this cat has very opaque lenses in both eyes. Uh, so this is what a cataract looks like in a cat. Dogs get cataracts too. The most common thing the veterinary ophthalmologists, the most common surgery veterinary ophthalmologists do uh, in the state of Florida is cataract surgery. Uh, it is a very specialized technique, you know, very similar to the human. Uh, it does require specialized equipment, specialized uh, care uh, and ability. This is another type of cataract, though. If you see on the, the uh, little bubbles uh, in the lens, it's on pretty much in the center of the screen. There's a very bright reflection, and then as you move away from the bright reflection, you see little bubbles. And those are actually cataracts just beginning. This animal can still see, uh, but these are little. This, this, these, these little cataracts that are occurring at the periphery of the lens are typical of diabetes. So if you have a diabetic dog. At some point in the management of that diabetic dog, somebody better look and examine the lens very well, especially the periphery of the lens, because that's where diabetic cataracts begin. Diabetic cats don't get cataracts very often. Diabetic cats do not. Diabetic dogs commonly get cataracts, and it's a real problem in the state of Florida. So if you are managing a diabetic dog, at some point we really need to look at the lenses very close up because if the dog loses its sight, it may influence the client's decision as to how to manage the case. Uh, I, we generally, many times ophthalmologists actually are ones that make the diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, the owner knows the dog's drinking more water. The owner knows the, owner, the dog's maybe lost a little weight. 
But what really bothered the owner was when the dog got cataracts suddenly. The diabetic cataracts developed suddenly, maybe over weeks to months. So sudden onset of cataracts should trigger in your mind uh, the fact that you want to do a blood test for sugar, a sugar level, a blood, blood sugar level on dogs and find out if they have diabetes or not. And if they have diabetics, if, if they have diabetes and cataracts, then the, that, that, that will involve a team effort of the ophthalmologist working on the eyes and you as general practitioner working on the uh, diabetes and managing them both. Now, one of the other problems we see in the state of Florida in the last few years due to the popularity of some television shows <laughs> and uh, movies is when the lens shifts out of its normal location. And if you look at this picture, there's a bright reflection right in the center of the pupil from the flash of the camera, but right uh, touching that, that uh, reflection, you'll see a line, uh, a part of a, a circle, a circular line, that's uh, the lens, and the lens has fallen downwards and to the right. The lens is normally sitting right in the pupil, but there's little ligaments to hold the lens in place, and they have shifted. They have broken down. These little ligaments have broken, and the lens has shifted. Now, this is a real problem in the terrier breeds. Uh, certain movies, certain TV shows have popularized Jack Russell Terriers and other breeds of dog, terrier breeds of dogs, and terrier breeds of dogs get these lens dislocations, also called lens luxations. It's a major problem. Uh, sometimes associated with blindness, sometimes associated with glaucoma, sometimes associated with eye pain. Sometimes the lenses shift from their location and nothing happens. But uh, if you work with many terrier breeds, which they are very popular, uh, if you work with many terrier breeds, take a close look at their eyes and see if you can identify uh, the lens being in its normal location. It does not necessarily require special equipment, just the idea and the thought to look. So the terrier breeds are at risk of the lens shifting from its normal location. I just want to talk about the retina a little bit. I know you, this diagram is not showing up too well. The lens is a very complex structure. Uh, it's normally transparent. Uh, some dogs and cats, uh, there are retinal blood vessels, but birds don't have retinal blood vessels. They, uh, uh, dogs and cats and birds depend on their choroid uh, for uh, most of the retinal nutrition. The retina has a higher metabolic rate than the brain. And actually, in some ways, the retina really just is the brain. Uh, it's an extension of the brain. And the retina collects the photons of light and converts them into electrical energy and sends that electrical energy back to the brain along the optic nerve. And the retina is, you know, it's very pretty. Uh, here's another dog. Uh, this is a different kind of tapetum, little islands of tapetum. You can see retinal blood vessels, the tapetums at the top, and non tapetums at the bottom. The non tapetum has pigment in it. The re those blood vessels you see are, are retinal blood vessels. Usually retinal blood vessels are red, choroidal blood vessels are orange. Uh, just to mention briefly, uh, this is the kind of color vision uh, that you see at the top, of the circle at the top, you see the three, uh, you know, red, red, yellow, and, and blues. And at the bottom of the screen, that are at least partially, you can see what we think animals see, the kind of color vision dogs and cats have. And dogs and cats don't see reds and greens very well. They see blues better, and maybe yellows a little, but it's a, it's a much different world. There's not much red uh, seen by the animals that we work in. Animals, people always ask us, do, do dogs and cats see color? Yes, they do see color. They just don't see the same colors we do. Uh, also, their eyes are adapted for seeing at night. Our eyes are adapted for seeing in the daytime. Dogs and cats, their eyes are adapted for detecting motion. Our eyes are adapted for, for seeing detail. Dogs and cats' eyes are not adapted for seeing detail. They're adapted for detecting motion because they're predators, at least evolutionarily. They're predator animals. So, uh, and, and so they function. Dogs and cats see better at night. They see their eyes are adapted for seeing, um, uh, detecting motion. Uh, uh, humans, our vision, and, and actually some birds too, uh, birds have better vision than we do. Birds have better color vision than we do, and they have better ability to, to detect motion and detect detail than we do. So, uh, but people always ask if dogs and cats can see color, and yes, they can. They just don't see the same kind of colors that we see. Now, one of the misconceptions about ophthalmology is, is that you need a lot of special equipment to uh, do ophthalmology. And to a certain extent, maybe 5% of ophthalmology, you need some special equipment. But the one thing that you really need, uh, I think there's two things in some sense, maybe three. 
Uh, Lisa, if you can put, put, put the camera back on me just for a second. Uh, one of the things that veterinarians don't have commonly is a bright light. And you need a bright light to do ophthalmology, but not an expensive one. I went to Target and I bought this light for $7. And I can do maybe 90% of my exams with this little light. Now I have to change the battery a lot because it's just a little battery. But I don't need a whole lot of special equipment to at least do basic ophthalmology. And I carry this light in my pocket, you know, and I can I use it all the time. And I have to change the battery. But let me go back to the, the picture, please. But, but you don't necessarily need a whole lot of equipment to do a good job. But you do need a bright light. And this picture has several pieces of equipment that are, that are, are, are useful. You can see uh, the pen light there as uh, uh, the, the gray uh, instrument sitting right in the middle. That's just kind of like the light I have. But you have to change the battery. The, the, the ophthalmoscope, which is to the right of it, you know, it costs a little bit more money. And it's surely useful, especially for looking at the, the retina, which you need to do. The only other things we really need are some fluorescine strips. They're critical. We need a light and fluorescine strips. Maybe we need some, some tear test strips as well. And so that, that would be beneficial. And some topical anesthetic and maybe some drops to, uh, eye drops to dilate the pupil when we want to look at the retina. But the retina is not that critical for us. Corneal disease is critical. As you get better with ophthalmology, you can start to feel more comfortable looking at the retina. But when you begin, or if you don't have too much experience with ophthalmology, then what I want you to worry about is the cornea. And to look at the cornea, you just need a bright light and some fluorescein dye strips. Uh, we mentioned this iris color change a little bit before. Maybe you can see I mentioned iris color change, especially in cats, can be caused by uveitis. Uh, uh, viruses were the, what I mentioned were bad, the FIV, FIP, uh, feline leukemia. Neoplasia, melanomas, and lymphoma can cause iris to cut, change its color. If the animal's icric or if there's hemorrhage, that can cause the iris to change color. And we sort of mentioned this before, and I showed you this particular cat, that in, in his right eye, the brown eye, he'd had uveitis. And it, it responded to treatment and got better, so he's not painful. Uveitis is a painful disease. Uh, just like corneas is. So if an, a cat that has uveitis will have a painful eye. He'll be squinting. He'll be tearing. What I'll want you to do is find out if you've got a corneal ulcer or not. If you find there's no ulcer in a cat with a painful eye, the next disease to think about is uveitis. And we'll have to deal with that in that question and answer session as to symptoms of uveitis. But what I want you to do if you have a cat with a painful eye, he's squinting or tearing, is you find out if there's a corneal ulcer or not. If there's no ulcer, the next thing in cats that you think of is cause a pain. Uh, the next thing to think of is, is, is uveitis. Here's another cat. His, look at his left eye, uh, uh, his right eye, I'm sorry, on the left side of the screen, his right eye. He's got a melanoma that's just beginning to grow in the iris. His, his, his left eye is normal for comparison. But the owner noticed the iris is changing its color. Uh, this is a cat that has blood in the eye. The owner says, no, he's, he's, the eye is turned red. Well, the, the, the redness was not in the conjunctiva. The red was because of blood clot uh, inside the anterior chamber. So we can't see the pupil because the blood is between the cornea and the iris. And this was an old cat. The cat had kidney disease. Uh, had all the classic signs of kidney disease, but the owner really hadn't noticed that or wasn't too bothered by the cat drinking more water and urinating more. But the owner was noticed, well, the owner was bothered by the change in eye color. And what happened was the kidneys were going bad. Uh, the blood pressure was increased. And blood, blood pressure got so high that it, it ruptured the blood vessels in the iris. And so we got hemorrhage or, you know, inside the eye. And so as we treated the uh, kidney disease and the eye, uh, the hemorrhage resolved and the cat could see. Now, this is a, 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 a one of the other tests that we need to mention. It's a very important test. It's basic ophthalmology. Right up there with fluorescein dye strips is is a tear test. And we put the, you can buy these little tear tests, uh, uh, they're called Shermer tear tests, and you put it in the lower lid, leave it there for a minute, and normally it, it will cause about 15 millimeters of wetting, 15 millimeters in one minute's time. If it's less than 15 millimeters, say if it's, if it's five millimeters or something, that can, that can mean there's too low, too little tear production, it would benefit and warrant some, uh, institution of therapy. But, uh, this is something that's done very early in the exam. If an animal has increased um, mucus, uh, mucousy discharge, uh, 
uh, a, a painful eye, uh, a Shermer tear test can be uh, beneficial in determining if the source of the pain or the source of the mucus uh, is due to a lack of tear production by the lacrimal gland, a lack of tear production by the third eyelid gland. It's just a basic kind of thing. Normal is about 15 millimeters of, med of wetting in a minute's time. Now, this is just a, a different diagram, diagram of the tear film. There are three layers. Uh, the eyelid produces part on the, the, the yellow part of the tear film on the left is produced by the meibomian glands in the eyelids. Most of the, the dark blue, which is the, the watery part of the tear film, is produced by the lacrimal gland and third eyelid gland. And then the reddish uh, line on the right, uh, the mucin layer, is produced by the conjunctival cells. And so uh, this is a very important structure. Uh, it is a common disease in the state of Florida. And so uh, it, it is something we need to consider. Certain breeds of dogs, Cocker Spaniels, get the dry eye problem. Uh, the Pekingese, Los Opsos, Shih Tzus, they get the dry eye problem. Uh, as part of, you'll probably, you'll probably see, it, uh, see it. Hugs get it. Uh, English Bulldogs, uh, these types of dogs are the ones that t seem to be uh, at increased risk uh, of, of not having enough tears. Here's another one of these pictures. Uh, a lot of mucus in this eye. The cornea is uh, dried out. It's turning brown. Uh, it's not. It's lost its its um, clarity. It's not shiny. In fact, some in its early dry eye, what what may be noticed is the cornea just doesn't shine because the tears are what tear film is what makes the cornea shine. And uh, so this is just a, an, uh, a a dog that has dry eye. And dry eye is treatable disease. Uh, here's a fluorescein strip. This is what this is critical. Uh, absolutely, I, I don't expect you to remember anything else tonight except this. Uh, and I'll be real irritated with you if you don't follow my advice. This is very important. Uh, using a fluorescein dye, putting a, putting a fluorescein dye in the eye and then rinsing it out and then looking for ulcers. Here's a dog that, had, that we already know it has an ulcer, but look how painful this dog's right eye is. He's squinting severely. This is a dog has got a very bad corneal ulcer. This is the eye itself. Uh, with the eyelids held open, uh, the eyes dry. This is a pseudomonas infection. Uh, terrible amount of, uh, of uh, edema in the cornea. Normally, the cornea is very clear because it, there, there's there's no water in it. Well, when the cornea, you get a corneal ulcer, you get an increase in water or edema, and so the cornea becomes cloudy. There's blood vessels growing in here. The cornea is very sensitive. Uh, so when the corneal epithelium has been removed. Uh, the corneal sensory nerves are stimulated and to cause eye pain. Uh, here's another one. This is a fluorescein eye. You can see the greenish area on a different eye that has an ulcer. Uh, here's another eye, a superficial ulcer that has uh, uh, the, the fluorescein dye retention. There's lots of different ulcers, superficial ones, deep ones. Uh, there's uh, chemical ulcers. There's dry eye ulcers. There are infected ulcers. There's a, a Many types of corneal ulcerations, melting ulcers. The therapies are all going to be similar in some sense that we treat infection, we treat the melting uh, problem that is associated with some of these ulcers in order to speed up healing. Uh, but we have to make the diagnosis first. So tonight we're worried about making the diagnosis. Here's, a, here's another ulcer with the fluorescein dye uh, in it. Uh, painful eye, cloudy eye, put the fluorescein on, we've got an ulcer. So now we can go to our books and notes and look up how to treat the ulcers. Glaucoma is also found in animals. Glaucoma means the pressure is too high. This is a little Great Dane puppy whose right eye is bigger than the other one. It was, it, uh, what happens in puppies is that this cornea and sclera are very elastic and the pressure inside the eye gets high because the fluid cannot leave the eye and the eye swells up very easily because the cornea and sclera are very elastic, much more so than in adults. Glaucoma is a terrible disease in animals. It progresses very quickly to blindness. It sometimes is associated with pain. Uh, we'll mention some, some treatments for it here briefly in a minute. But uh, it is a, a, a problem, something to consider in, the, in a dog or cat that has painful eyes. Uh, this is another kind of cataract. Uh, not a, you can just see a, a circular part of the cataract at the bottom of the, of the picture. Uh, the iris is blue, and uh, we, but we can see a, 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 an early cataract formation. Here's a little bird. Birds get cataracts too. You see this, the cloudiness in the center of the pupil in this little parrot. Uh, birds get cataracts as well. So uh, if you are uh, seeing exotic animals, make sure that to consider that the lens can become a cataract no matter what species. This is the ophthalmoscope. If you want to start buying uh, pieces of equipment, 
Beyond pen light, uh, Palma, this is the direct up telescope. It's rechargeable, uh, so you'll always have a bright light. You just have to learn how to use it. This is for looking at the at the back of the eye, for looking at the retina and optic nerve. Uh, this is another. Here's a dog. Uh, optic nerves in the center, retinal blood vessels. Tapetum's kind of hard to see in this one. It seems like it was at least bluish green, at least initially. But the the rest of the flash from the camera has bleached out the tapetal reflection at the top. Uh, let me just move back to that one a second if I can. L look how thick the blood vessels are, especially the, the blood vessel there at about 3 o'clock. See how the, how wide it is? Um, if you look at the next picture, you can barely see the blood vessels. They're so thin, you can barely see them. There are retinal diseases in, in purebred dogs in this state. Uh, they are uh, usually associated with the dogs not seeing very well at night. Uh, because there, there are two different kinds of cells in the retina, uh, one cell for seeing at night, one cell for seeing in the daytime. The, one, the cells that see it at night are called rods, and there are many, 90% of the cells in the retina in dogs and cats are rods, so that's an adaptation for seeing at night. As the rods die in some of these retinal atrophy diseases, uh, the blood vessels go away, as in this picture, and the dogs stop seeing at night. They can still see in the daytime, but because some of these diseases are progressive, uh, it is difficult to uh, uh, treat these, or it's impossible to treat them because they are genetic biochemical diseases. But the making of the diagnosis sometimes makes people uh, at least feel assured that there's not something that can be done to treat them. Uh, these are progressive uh, retinal atrophy diseases. And what you see in this picture is, is that it's very difficult to see the blood vessels because as the retina atrophies, the blood vessels disappear. Uh, cats with conjunctivitis, uh, this, this, we've seen this picture before. I just want to mention types of therapy. What I want you to think about if you see cats with conjunctivitis in Florida, if there's no corneal ulcer, uh, probably a herpes virus, could be mycoplasma, could be chlamydia. But if you see cat with conjunctivitis and no corneal ulcer, uh, chloramphenicol is a good uh, drug to start with. Uh, there's generic chloramphenicols. This one's called Bemacol. Um, different kinds of chloramphenicols, eye drops, eye ointments. I also should mention eye solutions, uh, as in the right part of the screen. Solutions are, are always better than ointments as far as getting medication to the eye, uh, but you have to give them more frequently. Ointments can be given less often. But ointments will slow down healing of ulcers. So in, in ulcer therapy, it's always best if the owner can to administer solutions rather than ointments. Tetracycline is good for cats with conjunctivitis as well because it kills mycoplasma and chlamydia. There are antivirals that are also available. Here's just conjunctivitis again. This is actually my own dog, uh, Labrador, and she has conjunctivitis periodically. No corneal ulcer, so uh, we treat her with an antibiotic and steroids. I'm sorry it doesn't show here, but uh, hydrocortisone is good for treating allergic conjunctivitis. A dexamethasone is good for uh, treating allergic conjunctivitis. Steroids are bad for ulcers. Do not use steroids topically for corneal ulcers in this state. Do not do it. Corneal ulcers are bad, uh, and they're worse if you use steroids. So you can see conjunctivitis in Florida. You can see ulcers in Florida. And the dogs with ulcers also have conjunctivitis. So if you see a case of conjunctivitis, make sure you find out whether there's an ulcer or not because the therapy is different. And if you don't check and find out if there's an ulcer, you're doing a disservice to your clients because the therapy for an ulcer with conjunctivitis is different than, the, than a pure conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis, we usually use antibiotics and steroids. Corneal ulcers, we never use steroids. Not in this state. And there's reasons for that. We can talk about that in the, answer, in the question and answer session. Here's a dog with glaucoma. The right eye is swelled up. It had to be surgically removed. Um, as far as glaucoma, I just want to mention a couple drugs, uh, three drugs we mentioned. This is a drug called Timolol, uh, T-I-M-O-L-O-L. It can be given twice a day to lower the pressure. Uh, pilocarpine in this picture, can, it needs to be given four to six times a day for, to lower the pressure. And what's come out recently is this drug called Zalatan, which is once a day to lower the pressure. It's really good in people. It seems to work in animals, too, and we can talk about glaucoma as another another lecture, another issue someday. But glaucoma is also here. Dry eye, I just wanted to mention, diagnose it with Schirmer tests or the tear tests. 
And uh, artificial tears are available. Don't need a prescription to get them. Uh, different different kinds seem to work off in dogs better. The tears natural on the right and hypo tears seem to work better in dogs than some of the other ones. They're not cheap though, but uh, you, know, you would think they would be cheap. But you, they can go to the clients can go to any pharmacy or any drugstore and just buy them without a prescription. Uh, what seems to have, uh, and that you can also buy little ointments as well that are also beneficial for dry eye. But what's revolutionized dry eye therapy though uh, is cyclosporin. Twice a day. It has to be given for several weeks before we find out if it works. Don't prescribe this drug unless you've done a Shermer test, though, to find out uh, if your tear protection is actually low. Uh, Optimune is a wonderful drug. Optimune is cyclosporin A. It's completely revolutionized dry eye therapy for animals. It gave us, it's given us a drug that's effective in treating this disease. It, it won't cure it, but it sure controls it. Well, I guess that's all I've got to say. So uh, for this, a uh, little brief encounter. So um, I'll be available, I guess, after you watch this for some questions and answers and a little bit of uh, uh, discussion as to uh, about veterinary ophthalmology. And uh, I hope this was beneficial and good luck to you on your exam.